Hi guys and welcome back. And today we get on with making the display stand for the 172nd scale Corsair. So on with the making and I thought rather than do the frame in timber, I'd try 3D printing it and a couple of reasons for doing that. I thought it would become duplicatable further down the track and I just really wanted to see how it would go. So printed those off um, because my print base isn't very large. I had to do them in two runs and each length as a half. So that was a bit problematic in terms of joining them up in some seam lines. Uh, just a little MDF base, 3mm MDF base, glued all the printed parts together and that fitted in very nicely. Just using super glue to join the timber to the resin. And it doesn't have to be super robust, it's not going to be poorly treated. Making sure everything was square, and then I'm just using the 3mm balsa wood for the walls of the little display stand. Now, I cut these with extraordinarily tight tolerances because I didn't want to have any filling around the timber and the resin where they joined and made sure it was a pretty level. And then like the Spitfire display, I'm going to have the emblem of the unit. In this case, it's the, the Marines illuminated on the front of the display. So it's just my test piece for size. It's not the final piece. It's just in normal paper. And then it was off to mark out how I cut that shape out of the front part of the display. So a little bit of measuring and mathematics, which much to my surprise, I actually got right first time. I often cut things in the wrong place and then go, how'd that happen? So to find the center, I measured up the center on the back of the actual emblem and measured up the center on the base and then put a pin through the center and aligned that to the center of the emblem and then pushed that through. And then I knew I was exactly in the middle of the available space. Carefully marked that out with the pencil to make sure it wasn't moving. And because I can sometimes lose focus, I always like to make a uh, fairly clear instruction for myself in case I have to come back and leave it and then come back later on and think, oh, which line am I cutting, the inside line or the outside line? So just carefully with the X-Acto blade. And got a reasonably good hole. Now just doing the measurements for the top of the display base. And again, I'm just using the Spitfire base as an absolute template for all of this. And then I like using the Mitosaur. It's a little bit of mucking around to get started, but it leaves you with really straight edges and you tend to not get the slightly angled edges if you went through it with just a blade. So the top of the display base will be aircraft carrier deck. And to do that, I've got some miniature icy pole sticks and some PE, which has got the tie down rails, for lack of a better term. So these are just uh, from the crafts shop, very cheap. Seven and a half centimeters long. When you cut the ends off seven centimeters, um, I did some math somewhere to say what that would be in 172nd scale, and I think it turns out to be about 9 foot, which seemed about right for a length of timber, but I didn't care that much to do deep research into it. This is the PE with the long runs for the tie-downs, which look very nice. I was contemplating 3D printing these, but um, eventually fell into the category of I just couldn't be bothered, to be honest. So a little bit tedious, cutting off all the ends. I didn't precisely measure them uh, because I didn't want it to look like it was precisely measured because it's a section of the deck. And so there'll be bits that, are, that overhang. Uh, so, so the edges of some ends will be shorter than others. And I want it to be a little bit random. Just putting on using the same sticks, just a facing edge and getting that all nice and smooth. 
and then just starting to stick down the decking basically with just PVA, the white glue. And again, no science. I just knew that I wanted three bits for each run because I thought two would just start to give a bit of uniformity that uh, wouldn't look realistic. So the P run tie downs are 2.5 mil wide and I had a piece of styrene beam that was 2.5 mil wide so I'm just using that as a blocker or a marker making sure everything's square as I stick it down and then give it a few minutes so it doesn't randomly move just testing here that it is in fact the right measurement and that's what it ultimately looked like just needed to clean up the edges, give them a bit of a sand, smooth off the rough bits because I figured a deck shouldn't have big lumpy bits of wood poking up. Just blow it all away and check again and it fits very nicely but it sits too low. So I cut some little bits of wire and have the thought of gluing those, if I can pick them up, gluing those into the channels where the tie-down rails will live. And again, just using super glue to do that. And absolutely zero science. I didn't measure it. I just eyeballed it and tried to keep them vaguely in line. They'll virtually be undetectable once it's all finished. But just having them there so that the rail is at the the tie down rails are at the same level of the actual decking. And at that point, I thought we'd better get some paint on the thing. So this is varnished wood from AK's old and weathered wood set, and just getting that on a little bit diluted. So because of the Icy pole stick things will uh, suck it up uh, very thirstily. And then going back over it a second time with just water, really diluting it further and washing off anything that hasn't yet been absorbed into the timber and then giving that a bit of a wipe with the, with the tissue. I think painting timber is very subjective and Along with most things, in, in my view, there's no absolute right or wrong. It's simply what you think looks good. I know there's lots of books on techniques and the various steps you have to use. I think you just do what you need to do until you get a result that you're happy with. So now just giving the facing edge a coat of German black brown and then running that same colour through the trench where the PE tie down rails will go. And now putting a little bit of uh, gun metal on the support pieces of wire for the tie down rails. And I thought it would just be easier to paint them while they were still on the PE sprue, or I think fret might be the right word. And then with a pin uh, secured by my Dremel, just started to poke in some nail holes, which hopefully will get filled up by wash to make it look a bit realistic. So a few weeks earlier, I'd printed out some of these uh, little PE pillars or blocks, and that was because I was making a, a measuring gauge for a mate of mine who does wood turning, and I just used these as a test to make sure I had the distances right uh, for the device I was making. But I hung on to these, so I don't know why I hung on to them, but then I realised they'd be the perfect little things to put on the underneath of the decking so that when I put it into the display stand, it wouldn't just fall off and it was nice and uh, secure. So with that done, then it was just a matter of whipping up the super glue yet again and getting that onto the little support rails. 
then carefully dropping the PE pieces in and I wanted a little bit of overhang on both ends so I could just trim those off. Not a, not a lot, in fact I think I might not have even done it on this first one. So this is very bendy, so one of the things I found doing the first couple is you've almost only got one shot at this, so you get it right, because if you don't get it right and then you've got to try and pry it up, they become quite uh, distorted in their shape. So uh, I'm not recommending this, but far better to have your finger stuck to the deck than try and um, pull it off before everything else is stuck. And just with the old sharp flat-sided clippers, then coming in and pinging them off. And then the last little bit I did before we moved on was to get a little bit of black paint into the nail holes, because I had doubts that the wash would actually hold, because they're not very big and I thought they might get missed. So at this point I was just um, filling some of the imperfections in the 3D printed base and initially here just using some of the old style Humbrel model filler and getting that in to get the bulk of it done. giving that a bit of a wipe down with isopropyl alcohol with the cotton bud. And at this point I had an epiphany and thought, I am going to do at least eight more of these, and perhaps if I cast this base, that will make things easier for me in the future. So all of the bases I intend to have illuminated with one of those sort of bigger dome-like things, I think they're called. From practice in the Spitfire one, it slides around all over the place when you try and move it and get it out. And in future, they won't have a little back door like the Spitfire base did. They'll all be like this one where you're able to lift off the top. So I thought, well, I'll just make a little ring fence around the light so that it's got somewhere to sit and not move around. And I just use the Aves two-part epoxy resin putty for that and just smooth it down. I mean, it's not going to be visible to the viewers, so it wasn't too fast. Then set about making a box to do the casting in. Just use the old hot glue gun. These don't need to be hugely robust for this sort of casting, uh, but they do need to be effectively watertight so that it can't leak out. And the hot glue gun, which is a, probably the only thing I use a hot glue gun for in this hobby, is uh, ideal for that. And then you can and also use it to seal around the edges so it doesn't take very long to cure. Now I noticed that when I put the base down into the box, there were a few little gaps underneath it, so not 100% perfectly level. And of course, if you if you leave those gaps, the silicon rubber will run in underneath them and not a disaster, but it just causes some problems. So I just used a little bit of plasticine to whack in any of those gaps. And they were, they were fairly tiny, but everything is accentuated when you're doing the casting. So the slightest little imperfection will get replicated often imperfections that you can't see on the original but then you suddenly see in the uh, in the first copy so i use this pinky saw from barnes it's a two-part one-to-one ratio silicone this is probably the biggest casting in terms of size uh, and therefore volume so I wasn't 100% sure. I know smarter people than me can do the math and measure the size of the box that the object's going into and then deduct the size of the object. And I've watched guys on YouTube who are brilliant at doing this stuff. And they, you know, they do their pour and there's like one mil left over. They're absolutely spot on. My brain doesn't work like that. I just can't do the math. So I just sort of eyeball it and I had to do two pause because I completely underestimated how much it was in this first pour. So give that a 
really good mix up it, the two different colors is helpful so you, you you know when it's really well mixed when you don't have any sign of the the white in what becomes the paler pink a little bit of super glue on the bottom of the actual base so it doesn't move around and then gently Initially just pouring into the corner, and the theory behind that is because I don't have a de-guessing machine, there's always the risk of bubbles, so just constantly pouring into the one spot in a, in a sort of gentle drizzle and just letting it run around the edges. In theory, that's supposed to push the air ahead of itself and therefore not get stuck between the silicon and the object. And that was how badly I'd underestimated the first pour. I just barely got it up to the side, but luckily it doesn't take long to do. And I had the second pour in before the first pour started to cure. You've probably got about 30 minutes working time with this stuff. And you see in the second pour, I, I was not as fussy because uh, theoretically the air around the edges of the model should have gone. So that's how it came out and looked pretty clean. I couldn't see any visible air bubbles on the surface. And this is just me filling it up with water, which was my alternative approach to not being able to do the maths. So I'll just fill it up with water and then I'll know how much water it took to fill it. And that will give me how much resin I need to make. So I use the Barnes Easy Cast, which is the two part resin. And it's a one to one relationship as well, so pretty straightforward. I marked up on the two plastic cups 50% uh, each of the volume of water that was in there and then I added another probably 10% just for a safety margin. And same theory as previously, gently pouring into just one corner with the thought that the resin as it moves through the mould should be pushing any of the air ahead of itself and therefore avoiding bubbles. Certainly having a de-guessing machine would be a big uh, advantage from a quality point of view, but I don't do enough of this to really warrant the investment. And then sort of gently working it over the top, there's not the same risk of air catching on the flat surface like that. And I just concentrated on trying to get some into the edges there. So if there were any bubbles, and you can see a couple of bubbles there, then they're not a disaster on the bottom like that because they'll be on the bottom and they can be easily sanded. So I didn't need my 10%. I um, should have just trusted my water calculation method. And I noticed it wasn't 100% level, which would not be ideal. So I just jacked up one end of those little icy pole sticks that I had lying around, which was all it took to get it back in, and then just gently tapping it. And you can see how quickly this is going off. Uh, it's got a cure time of about 20 minutes, but it'll turn white and it tends to turn white in the deepest parts first and I think it's because they generate more heat because there's more volume so just tapping away it looks a lot more violent because I think I was um, moving the camera at the same time it's nowhere near as violent as that it looks like I'm having an earthquake uh, we don't get too many earthquakes down in Melbourne you can probably see down near my left hand there's a couple of big bubbles uh, and they've been there right from the get-go. I skillfully managed to ignore them for long enough that even when I gave it a quick burst with the torch, which should burst any of the bubbles, it left them as noticeable, but didn't affect the levelness of the of the ultimate end result. Now, by this stage, when I'm just poking around, that it was pretty much hardened. I, I got it out. I, I forgot about it for about half an hour, but uh, probably about 45 minutes after pouring, it was ready to come out. You just got to be gentle because you want to preserve the mould. You don't really want to do huge damage. And basically, it's not stuck in there. It's vacuumed in there. Uh, there's a bit of a vacuum seal going on. So you just want to break that seal. And once you get enough of it open, the rest of it should be pretty straightforward. So not too bad. A little bit of flash around the bottom edges, but that's to be expected with an open pore like that. There's a goober on that side there. And when I looked at the mould, there was... Uh, yes, there had been an air pocket that I'd not managed to eradicate, but I don't mind that. I call that an outie. So outies are easy because you can just sand those down. Innies would be more complicated because then you have to fill and sand. 
And then I think I mentioned earlier that I'd made the box with zero tolerance, like it was as tight as tight could be. And of course, the resin shrinks slightly. And when I measured this, it had shrunk about 0.2 of a mil. But that was how tight my tolerances were with the original that uh, the box wouldn't fit in. That's no big deal at all. Just give it a bit of a clean up with the sanding sticks. Didn't really need a lot of clean up, so I was happy about that. A few little blemishes, but not enough to make me go, oh, that was a complete failure and I, and I can't use it. I think now I can produce these bases from poor to clean up, ready to go in, in maybe less than half an hour. The light stays uh, secure. It shouldn't get violently shaken like that. So if it stays in that scenario, it should stay in just moving off the shelf and what have you. And that constitutes the casting section. So into the run home now, and I just needed to cut a perspex window for the back of the plaque so it was a little bit more robust. Measured that up directly onto the white protective plastic of the perspex. And then a little bit of fiddly cutting with the mitre saw to make sure I kept it as straight as possible. Once that was out, just give it a bit of a sand to make it nice and smooth and then the test fit and it fitted in quite nicely just making sure that the actual graphic will fit over it properly getting a good base coat of just plain flat black down over everything And then a little bit of gunmetal uh, blurting is the technical term I'm going to use. And then going back in with the flat black on a much gentler pressure to just soften those edges and get rid of some of the overabundance of the gunmetal. Hitting everything up then with a clear varnish. And doing the same to the flight deck. Now, I agonised over this because a lot of the research I'd done said that the decks were painted blue, and I was really happy with the colour of the deck as it was, so I had to agonise between artistic preference and some form of historical accuracy, so I sort of compromised by putting a wash of blue on and then getting it off straight away, so it hopefully looked like a deck that had started life having been painted blue, but through just usage and wear and tear and the sun and everything like that, you know, extreme weather conditions will uh, affect the paint, that it had largely come off, but there was a the hint of, so it was sort of a nod to the blue decks without actually having a big, bright blue deck. Thanks, Leza, for your advice on that. Much appreciated, mate. So I finished that off with another brisk sanding, just again to take it, any of the blue right off the highlights. came back in with a little bit of rust and look I don't imagine they would be very rusty I think they'd be reasonably well maintained and in fact I'm not even sure probably made of a rust resistant material I'm not 100% sure so I got the rust in and then watered it down pretty liberally and then dabbed it off so there's a again there's a hint of rather than a prominent sort of this is rusting to hell sort of appearance Then I thought I need to unify the whole thing, so I used the Panzer Aces new wood in a really uh, diluted wash and splashed that pretty casually over the top of it all. And then back in with just water to dilute it even further, so really wanting to have that unifying tone, but not having it prominent. And then with a large and dry brush, wiping it off. And you may think, well, why bother? But it did make a, a quite a big difference in sort of unifying the whole thing whilst letting each of the individual sort of planks keep their own unique tones. And it muted the blue wash um, quite nicely as well. So onto the plaques, and I just printed a 3D plaque out for the Corsair, which will go right on the bottom rail of the base. 
that was just done in brass and uh, a little bit of Russian green to get the, the dark shadows and then back over with a bit of gold to get the highlights and just sort of controlling that with the cotton bud to get any surpluses off. Marked up the middle of the base, marked up the middle of the plaque. Three dots of super glue, not very much because I don't want it to squeeze out the top or the bottom. Lined it up with my wonky eyes. Just raised that up so I didn't want it to get stuck to the paper. So this is the frame for the Marines emblem. And that, of course, was also 3D printed, which I'm finding really helpful for these sorts of things. I'm still working through the technical aspects of figures themselves. It's almost there, but not quite 100% happy with the consistency and results I'm getting. But for things like this, geometric shapes that I can do in Tinkercad, pretty good success rate. Checking for fittage, and it fitted quite well. Some bronze for the base coat, a wash of Russian green, and then I'm dabbing on here just some black to give it a sort of aged, weathered look. Moment of truth. Hopefully I had all my measurements right. Again, just tiny little dots of the PVA white glue because I don't want it to squeeze out the sides. And, and again, it shouldn't be under a huge amount of duress, and you could argue that I probably put too much glue here, uh, or way more than was needed, but sometimes I get carried away. Carefully placing that on, putting a bit of a weight on it so it uh, stayed nice and flat. That's just the printer platform. I measured it all up and marked where the bottom corners had to be with those two pins. Bit of super glue on the back of the actual frame itself. Line it up with the pins and just let it come down gently. And that's pretty much it. Illuminated and the um, light has a remote control so I can change the colours. Just darkening the room now so you see the illumination a little bit better. And that's all the lights off now, so that's all you can see. So with that, I think it's time to get into the final reveal. A uh, couple of laps on the magic spinning wheel and a few close-ups. And that will just about be that.
so that's pretty much it guys and i'd have to say i'm really happy with how this came out and i think the uh, casting of the base will make the future ones much easier to do and and far more consistent in appearance which is sort of what i was looking for i was really happy with the way the deck came out in the finish and uh, all in all a uh, quite enjoyable little project So thanks for watching guys, I hope you enjoyed it. Uh, just to give you a sneak peek at what I'm currently working on and what will be the next video, I finally picked up, I decided to finish off the 1 16th scale mini art French Cuirassier and making some good headway with that now that I'm actually focused on it. So the horse is largely finished, not completely finished, but I'd say all the base painting and shading and I've done some oil shading and blending on that as well with the, the greys as it gets further underneath the, um, around its guts. I don't actually, the girth, I'm not sure what it's called. So that's reasonably good and starting to work on the bits and bobs that will finish off the figure itself. So that's um, progressing nicely and should be the next thing you see. So off to the goodbye and catch you in the next one. So if you like this video, hit the thumbs up and share. Subscribe if you're not already a subscriber and ding the donger. And of course, leave a comment because I love reading them. Cheers!